Hey, um, Camillo. Hey. Yeah. Well, can um, it's, it's 635. Yeah. I think we should start. Okay. Let's okay. start. So welcome everyone to another of our book talks that uh, Ronnie puts together every season. Um, today we have Dr. Barbara Mann. And uh, I'd, before we start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge we are on unceded territory of the Lenape people. And I would like to thank all of you for um, attending our, our talk tonight. And uh, would uh, also like to um, introduce Ronnie. Ronnie is our instructor, letterpress, printer, and artist, and part of CBA. Uh, community, very important part of CBA community. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you, Camillo. Um, for this evening's session of Book Talk, we're very lucky to have Barbara Mann with us to speak about the object of Jewish literature, a material history. Uh, Bar Barbara received her doctorate from University of California at Berkeley and is currently a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York having previously been a member of the faculty at Princeton. Her areas of expertise include Israeli and Jewish literature, modern poetry, critical theory and urban studies and fine arts, and that's just naming a few. Um, she is the author of several publications and articles, and this talk is on the cusp of the publication of her book by the same name as this talk, which will be published by Yale University Press this summer. And I will put the link in the chat. Um, the chapter in the book, which focuses on artist books, begins with a quote by Mallarmé. Everything in the world exists only to end up in a book. I think most of us here would agree. Um, I will ask you during Barbara's talk, if you have questions to put them in the chat, and when her um, presentation is finished, I will um, deliver her questions to you. And if possible, we'll open it up so that people can ask them live. So without further ado, let's join in welcoming Barbara. Thank you so much, Oni. Um, it's just really an honor to be here um, for the pre-publication talk about my book, The Center for Arts is a place that is really um, near and dear to my heart. I have not been able to get down there since before COVID, but I'm looking forward to, to many more hours um, making books and working with my hands there in the future. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And while I'm speaking, I have a lot of images. And I might move kind of quickly through them at some point. Um, but I can always come back to any of them if, um, if there are questions or comments, things that you, you want to see. Again, I'm going to share my screen and I'm also going to turn my video off so that you don't have to watch me doing this up in the corner. So first things first. So this is the cover of the book and um, I wanted to begin with um, because the cover um, features the cover of a Yiddish little magazine called Egens, which means like of ourselves or by our those words, that's kind of a little difficult um, to translate. I'm gonna just ask somebody to give me a thumbs up th that you can hear me. Yes, Lynn, I see you out there. Richard Minsky, can you guys hear me? Good, because I'm gonna now put this little video off. Um, and I'm thinking about this cover a lot, obviously, in recent um, weeks, because it was a Yiddish magazine that was published in Kiev um, a little over a hundred years ago today. So, um, you know, Jewish life in that region is long lived, and um, we've all witnessed in recent weeks sort of the fragility and the vulnerability of uh, human populations there. And, um, you know, it. I'm sure the books are also suffering. Um, I want to uh, do a little bit about me, um, my background. I, you know, as, as Ronnie said, I have this kind of disparate set of interests. I think I put them all on rubric of the relationship between literature and the world, or the relationship between literature 
and other forms of cultural expression, particularly um, the arts, photography, painting, architecture. Um, I've also written about um, memory and space, memory and place. Um, but this book, um, this book, it really began in the archives. Um, if I, if I, you know, if I'm honest with myself, it kind of, um, I spend a lot of time in the archives and spending all that time in the archives has kind of sensitized me to the fragility of the book and textual materials related to the book, how vulnerable they are. Um, you know, these kind of uh, objects that are really under a lot of all the time. They're crumbling, they need protection, you're allowed to touch them, you're not allowed to touch them. And, um, you know, just one example of some of the material that you'll be seeing a little bit later as well. Um, these are objects that are, that are quite fragile, that are sort of in need of protection, but then they're also quite thrilling to, um, to touch, right? There's something about actually being able to handle them, even in their of crumbling state, um, as opposed to uh, you know online or on the screen, um, that has never you know sort of failed to thrill me. And I think that that ongoing interaction with books, with texts, with uh, other archival materials over the years has really made me think a lot about um, the book project or you know the materiality of the book. So. This is not um, a kind of a new, I would say, you know, this is not a, a new tradition within Jewish tradition. Um, the connection between materiality and the sacred for Jewish texts goes back a long way to, or to prayer book, to scrolls, um, the Torah scroll in, partic in particular. So there's a long tradition of treating books as sacred objects um, to the fact that they contained um, they contained God's name written down in print, and thus they were sacred. So this uh, kind of this connection between uh, Jewish culture and the text is longstanding, as was noted in the conversation a little bit earlier while we were all sort of around to start. Um, and it's even a kind of a meta topic in uh, modern Jewish art. This is a painting from the ninth, from 1934, Moses Sawyer called The Lover of Books. You can see um, you know, this gentleman here sort of featured between uh, these, these perhaps Talmud folios or folios of religious books um, in his hand. But then in the background, there's the sort of the competing, um, competing features of, of modern art and of sculpture. So my own interest is not in these ancient sources, but what might be called secular genres, in other words, lyric poetry, the novel. I'm interested in what happened to all of this sacredness and all of this materiality once, um, once we, once we you know, got to era, the modern era where um, there was a, a kind of a, a, a production of these secular genres. So the novel, for example, uh, this is just one example of Henry Roth's Call It Sleep, also from 1934. The, my book itself, is organized by genre. And I'm going to be using that word a lot this evening. In other words, in, in each chapter, I look at a different genre, be it the novel or poetry, artist books, which we'll get to in a little bit. And for each genre, I sort of ask, you know, what is their material essence or their material affordance? So the book is organized by genre, but it's also a history from the late 19th century to today. So before I get to um, the artist books, which are, you know, sort of the most of the images that I have to show you, I want to say a little bit about um, other, you know, other kinds of visual material that I talk about in the book. So the first, um, the first genre that we'll look at is this thing called the little magazine or the journal. This is uh, perhaps the preeminent genre of interwar cultural expression. These are just two examples. Um, a magazine called Milgron Rimon. It was actually published simultaneously, Milgron in Yiddish, Rimon in Hebrew. Both are the word for uh, pomegranate. Um, this is published in Berlin in, in, in 1922, um, but it's really a kind of a global phenomena, really, um, the publication of these little mag that are produced in these larger cities, um, which often collaboratively produced by emigre populations, these Jewish emigre populations and provincial towns, they find each other 
and they create these kind of small masterpieces of image and text. The print runs are relatively um, maybe a thousand copies, maybe 1500 copies, um, but they kind of circulate in lending libraries and, you know, sort of personally being sort of handed off and, and mailed to friends. And there's a lot of this image text interaction in them. In the beginning, and I want to say just to hear this figure of the pomegranate, some of them expressly interact with or kind of draw on, I really should say invent uh, the Jewish artistic tradition. So the pomegranate is a symbol in the Bible for art. It's uh, part of the, the decorative uh, motifs that are priestly robes in Jerusalem. So the pomegranate is like an, Im uh, an image with, with a lot of symbolic weight. Other of these magazines were a little less interested in that Jewish iconography and were in fact really kind of related to um, really the, the broader avant-garde uh, play, an interest in the alphabet um, as an iconic form. Um, this is probably one of the more notorious examples of uh, Jewish art from this period. This is a Yiddish picture poem by a poet named Uri Tzvi Greenberg from 1919. He wrote first in Yiddish and later Hebrew. And as you can see, it's in the form of a cross and it's called Uri Tzvi on the cross. And he sort of writes about um, himself as a victim and as a martyr. And these are sort of common tropes within Jewish writing in the period. Um, nobody goes quite this far. Um, and uh, you know, the, the poem itself is really a kind of a provocation. And, and the issue was actually, um, this issue of the magazine was actually censored by the authorities. Another example from Albatross published in Warsaw, you could see here again, the sort of this attention to, uh, to really strong sort of visual form and an attention to the alphabet the year here, sort of spelled out in letters and up on top as well. These are images which, which might be familiar to some of you. Again, these are covers of magazines, little journals that were published in this interwar period. Um, in this case, Marc Chagall is the artist. Chagall was really a kind of a central figure in, um, in this kind of floating group of artists moving between Paris, Moscow, Warsaw, Kiev, Lvov, uh, Berlin, of course. And so here we have two really wonderful examples of covers he, um, that he created. This one on your left is Khaliastra, which means roughly like the gang or you know the people who I like to hang out with. And we see a kind of a Chagall-like figure. These are all figures who were sort of involved in um, the production of this journal in Paris and Chagall himself, um, or maybe this is Chagall down there. Actually, it's hard for me to see, but this figure um, has the word Paris, Paris in Yiddish. Um, and they're all kind of participants this terrifically fun and vibrant and energetic effort of producing this little magazine. Here we have um, Strom, which means stream, published in Moscow. Um, I'll just point out again with the letters here, um, you know, Chagall, here's this little face. And this is uh, the flourish here, resets um, kind of the same kinds of flourishes that you would see in a Torah scroll. So, you know, you have, um, you know, this, um, these, these works that have, uh, speak in, in several different languages, in several different artistic languages, right? They're interested in traditional Jewish forms, but they're also really very much um, a part of the avant-garde. So now I have one small rabbit hole, um, which, which I have to go down with you just to see if it works. I'm gonna come back to, again, the cover of this Yiddish uh, journal, Egens in Kiev, and show you also just the extraordinary uh, table of contents um, produced by the same artist. Um, and I'm looking here at these kind of the art deco details and the hand letterings. Again, notice these flourishes, they're called coterot, these little crowns, which are very much, you know, I mean, this is a, again, in this little magazine, you've got short fiction, you've got erotic poetry, um, you have lettering that comes or that sort of mimics um, the lettering of the scribe in the Torah scroll. So it's really, um, it's super interesting in my mind. And really this, again, this kind of artistic language that speaks in a bunch of different directions. You might ask, where does this come from? It's not just the influence of 
uh, sort of the avant-garde in Paris or, you know, the artists and the writers that are surrounding these people. Um, there's actually a kind of an indigenous uh, artistic language, Jewish artistic language um, that can be dated to the late eight, to the late 1700s, found in synagogues throughout Belarus and the Ukraine. These are murals. I apologize for the quality of the photograph. The synagogues no longer exist. And we do have some photographs of the murals. This is from the Mohugog in Belarus. And the, the pictures were taken and then sketched um, on an ethnographic expedition to Belarus by, by Barry, the artist of the, who created the Egan's cover and his partner in crime, um, El Lizitsky. And so there is a kind of a, an indigenous, if you will, so here, right? So here's again the mural, an example from the, the, the synagogue mural, a sketch by Elizitsky or Berybach, and then you can see uh, this kind of really interesting permutation to the cover of this avant garde Yiddish magazine. Elizitsky, these artists themselves, you know, I always kind of take with a grain of salt when artists make statements about their work. But in this instance, we have, you know, uh, kind of some evidence that these artists, uh, you may know him as El, uh, Elizitsky, but his full name is Eliezer, right? He went by Eliezer when he was decorating uh, past Gadas and Chad Gadyaz, but a little while uh, later, he changed it to this more kind of abbreviated form. Um, and, Eliz and Elizitsky himself made a connection between the Talmud, between you know, one of the holiest books in Jewish tradition, and the little magazines, right? These few pages held the same function in their time as illustrated journals do in our own day. They familiarized everyone with the art trends of the period. So again, this ability to kind of um, take a, a kind of an older or more traditional, uh, what was perceived as a kind of a Jewish artistic form. This is a tiger, a namer, and create something wholly, you know, wholly new. So. That's it for the little magazines for um, for the time being. And again, I'm happy to go back to any um, of the pages, any of those images, any of those pages um, in a little bit. I want to kind of shift for a moment and get to and get to the artist books. Um, but before I do, I really have to just say one small thing about two other genres that are kind of there along the way in the immediate. Um, uh, period during the, the war and the post-war. And, and these are kind of the bridge, I would say, right? The, the book begins in this very heavily modernist period, poetry, novels, little magazines. And then by the end, we're in this kind of post-war, post-modern period with the artist books. Um, but in between, there's a couple of bridges. And the first bridge is a very unusual genre called the books, or these are memorial books. These are books that were produced in the years immediately after, um, after the war. Uh, you can see some as early as 1948. We have a couple of examples from the 30s. These are books that were produced not as artist books, not as works of art, but as tombstones, as replacements for the towns that were um, destroyed during the war. Um, they were often also produced collaboratively by descent survivors um, of the town as a way of recording the history of the town. They're filled with maps. They're filled with lists of people who were killed. They're filled with kind of memoirs and mini histories. And they're, they're big. They're really huge. They're, you know, four or 500 pages a piece and massive dimensions. This is, they, they conceived of themselves as a kind of a tombstone. And they often use... Um, this iconography of a book being damaged or um, destroyed. So that's a really important part of my, you know, again, going back to that big question that I posed at the beginning that I'm really interested in, in the book as a whole, what happens to material in Jewish books, particularly after the war and after the Holocaust, when, when, when books are destroyed and material Jewish life is um, destroyed. So these books are kind of another another bridge uh, on the way to um, the artist books. Another genre that I'll mention again, just briefly, um, art novels, um, what I'm calling the international language of comics. These are, um, you know, a, a form, again, image and text together, global form from, you know, Le Chateau Rabanne, this is published in Paris and set in Algeria. 
all the way to an Israeli graphic novel set in Warsaw, uh, wonderful Nora Krug that moves between Berlin and New York, and of course, um, and of course, Mao. So this is another way I think in which you know we can see kinds of creative um, permutations of materiality within texts by by Jewish authors. But now we really need to get back to um, that quote that Roni um, mentioned, which is the epigraph uh, to the final chapter of my book, which is the book on, which is the chapter on artist books. And I'll just say the name of the chapter is On the Seam, Artist Books and the Unmaking of the Book. And I love here, um, you know, these two quotes, the one from the end of the 19th century and the, the one towards the end of the 20th century, um, Alarme, everything in the world exists only to end up in a book, probably the author of one of the earliest artist books. In other words, one of the earliest books that played with uh, the iconic properties of text um, in a really sustained fashion. And up to our own, I don't want to say our current moment, but almost our current moment. Recognition here in this quote, um, in the old art, the writer makes texts. In the new art, the writer makes books. One of the sort of preeminent theorists of artist books. Uh, what, what I think is, you know, for me, the main point here is, again, this, this recognition that art needs to do something different after the war. And this is 1980. It's a little bit later than that. Um, but this, this, this notion that you just can't go on doing the same old, old right? That there's some kind of uh, 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 disruption that needs to go on. And, um, and this disruption, um, you know, kind of emerges in this really eclectic and amazing post-war genre called um, the artist book. And, and for me, the artist book is really the kind of, it's like the apotheosis for everything that I want to say about the book as a vulnerable object um, that endures. Um, artist books are a kind of a huge category. Um, we have on the one hand, these kinds of really singular fine arts editions, objects of art in, in, in and of themselves to, um, to, to something that Johanna Drucker has called um, Pratic multiples, in other words, books that are produced in um, in these really kind of you know large editions and many 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 copies. So uh, you know, in thinking about this and in wanting to write about the artist book in my in my book and wanting it to kind of be the concluding piece, I had to kind of come up with my own definition, and so uh, and so I did. Um, and so the to me, the artist book is any book that interrogates its properties as a book. In other words, it has to thematize itself the book, whether in form or in content. They could maybe critique um, the codex. They might use non-standard um, materials. Um, some of them even kind of harken back to those older forms like the scroll. So you can see, and some of them have that kind of image text play of the little scene. Um, but, but this sort of, again, this kind of questioning the book as a form is sort of at the heart of what I think artist books ask us to do. Now, given the centrality um, of, of text in Jewish cultures, it's not surprising to find um, Jewish artists working with this form. So um, Lynn Avedenka, who's here on screen with us, I'm really um, just really honored and, and tickled that, you, that you're that you here. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of your books, right? So this in this is just one example where there's um, a kind of a, a re, what I'm gonna call a kind of a repurposing of a Jewish text, but in this case, a kind of a marginal or almost a non-standard Jewish text, right? It's not the Talmud or the Bible, um, so the reference there is to Chad Gadya, which is a, a song in Aramaic that actually was originally written in Yiddish, um, the Passover table. Um, and that book itself, that song inspired, of course, Elizitsky. He is everywhere. Um, and Lynn has given us uh, a kind of a really uh, marvelous rendition um, of, that, of that original Hebrew, Aramaic, Yiddish, English, um, you know, sort of again uh, with these with these lovely, you know, sort of flat pages and these really striking 
Um, the letters here, the, the words here, this is the word for Mayim, and you can see these little waves here, Malach HaMavet, and there's this kind of death sort of bird, a shochet, the butcher knife. So, I mean, I think that there's, I like to think that there's, you know, a really interesting line that comes from those covers, those Chagall covers, um, with their playfulness. They're playful and they're serious, but they, again, speak in a couple of different um, artistic languages at the same time. I will show one more uh, really beautiful um, artist book, courtesy of Lynn, of course. Um, this is called By a Thread. And um, the staging, again, um, it's, it's, it's not a repurposing, but it's a kind of a, a restaging of, uh, of Scheherazade as a conversation between two women, Shahrazad and the biblical queen Esther. So again, the choice here, and Lynn, I would be curious to, to hear your thoughts about this if I have this right instance. The, you know, Esther is a, is a book of the Bible, but it's also like kind of kind of a weird choice to be in the Bible, right? It's it's not very Jewish, as some people will say, right? And even Perm is sort of an outlier in terms of Jewish holidays. So the choice here um, to bring this conversation between Scheherazade um, and Queen Esther and the book opens up in this fabulous way. Um, and I'll just read a little bit of the sort of the rationale for, you know, this kind of really serendipitous, but also enormously productive and profound meeting of these two women. No historical thread connects Esther and Scheherazade, though it should be simple enough to find one. Two women, Persia, both second wives of brutish, brutal kings, both aided in their acts of courage by trusted family companions. When was the link between them broken? What have we lost because of this break? How is the book unmade and how can we make it, how can we remake it or put it back together? Um, so to convince ourselves, we invent our own story. Um, one of the connections between two women, Jewish and Muslim. And while historians are dismissive, is the connection between these women that leads to the stories that lead to stories. There is no end to the stories. And the book itself, um, you know, you can turn it over and over um, in the, 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 the tale just kind of, the story just kind of catches itself by the tale and repeats. A couple more um, examples here from another um, wonderful female artist, um, Andy, Andy Arnovitz, who's based in Jerusalem. And um, this is a multilingual edition as well, the text is in Hebrew, English, and Arabic. Um, and she's playing here the title Living Borders plays on the expression in Hebrew, Gadelchai, which simply means shrubs, but a living fence, right, is how um, shrubs are uh, uh, this kind of shrub here, which slices across the city and imagines connections between East and West Jerusalem in a way that is both politically provocative and also honestly just makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, let me just see if I have one more of hers here. Yeah. Um, in Arnovitz's work, she's also interested in this kind of repurposing of certain older Hebrew texts. So these are um, poems by Esther Rab, who's a Hebrew poet from the early 20th century. And you see here, again, this is a one-off. This is one of those, you know, sort of fine arts editions. It's a work of art in and of itself. And it, it raises, it brings me to, again, uh, one of the central questions that I'm thinking about in my book um, in relation to the materiality of the book as an author. And I'd like to just bring in here the work of Edmond Chavez. Uh, have you seen how a book is made and unmade? Um, it was a French writer, Egyptian born, um, who writes about the vulnerability of the book. Um, after the war. And so it seems to me that these artist books really, a really productive um, example of how um, a book can be made and unmade, which is different and, and, and kind of sensitize uh, um, to, to, our, to our process as readers. So just to think about this, and we can maybe talk about this a little bit in the, you know, in the, in the discussion after, um, this idea of a book being made and unmade is not the same as a book being destroyed, and it's not the same as a book being banned, right? It's a different, it's a, it's a process, right? It's a process that brings us um, to new places and to new questions. I, I will say here, and I would really be curious to hear from the, the book artists um, 
in the group this evening, um, you know, your thoughts on this point, on all of it really, but on this point in particular, um, I said earlier that it shouldn't be surprising given the relationship between, uh, you know, the sort of the centrality in Jewish culture, it's not surprising that we have many um, Jewish book artists, but there are also a predominance of female book artists. Um, I don't know, has anybody ever sort of taken a poll? Those of you who are at the CBA, I'd be curious about this. What do you make of the centrality of women in this field such that um, at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, there's one catalog and, and then of this other really beautiful, beautiful catalog edited by Judith Hofberg, um, Women of the Book. I'll just show a couple of examples from there. And, you know, they're, they're sort of, it's it, again, not maybe surprising that, um, that women in a religion such as Judaism has historically been, would look to these kind of alternative forms of expression. Um, we might even say that they're working outside the book, right? Outside the book, capital B there, outside, you know, some of the sort of normative um, uh, textual, the normative patriarchal text Charms that we find in traditional Judaism, um, also the connection between uh, women and craft. So this is a longer conversation. I would really be delighted um, to pick that in the discussion. One, one last kind of extended example, and then and then maybe pause, and, and we'll see if there are some, some questions and things that people want to bring forward. So this is the image, um, just to go back for a moment, on the cover of this wonderful catalog, Woman of the Book, Jewish Artists, Jewish Themes, you see this very um, striking image. Um, this is uh, a, a, this book by Tatana Kellner, um, B11226, 50 Years of Silence, Eugene Kellner's story. And there are actually two, one for her mother and one for um, her father. Um, Kellner is a, a, a child of survivors, and, and, and in this book, she tells the story of her parents. Um, you know, uh, um, the, the, the book is, is completely unique. There are basically, there are 50 copies of this that exist out there, um, but you see it kind of comes in this box, and the book itself is, is around a plaster of Paris cast of her father's arm, complete with the, the number that he received in the camps. And then the book opens up, each page is kind of cut away around the arm. Um, and in the book itself, we have family photographs. We have, you can see here, sort of the handwritten testimony in check um, from the parents, uh, photographs that relate to the artist's own experience um, visiting in the camps, um, this is again a translation. You can see the the story there. Um, this is her father's story, and another um, example from the book. These are this is a picture of a family in front of um, the Pinkas Synagogue in Prague. It's one of the oldest Holocaust memorials in Europe. So it's you know this book is really it's it's not a Yisker book. It's not um, a memorial book in in, in sort of the, the way that those other uh, that other example that I that I showed you, but it has, I think, I think it shares this kind of desire to produce a book that is also a memorial object, um, that is also an object that can communicate um, about transgenerational trauma, particularly um, on the whole of the body. So one last, I'm going to skip these for now. I'm going to go to my book. Um, and I can come back to talk a little bit more um, about Jerusalem, but this is um, one of my attempts at an artist book. And I completed this about five years ago at a, a wonderful workshop at the, in Salt Lake City, at the Salt Lake City Community College. They have uh, just a tremendous uh, team and, and group of colleagues working on, on book arts. Um, and I was just fortunate to be able to spend um, part of the summer there with them. And, and in my artist book, I tried to kind of tap into some of the, some of the themes and some of the 
I treat in a more scholarly fashion in the book, but in this case, in um, a work of art. So the book is called uh, Devarim Zachin, Things. Devarim is the Hebrew word for things. It's also um, the name of the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible. So this little bold letters here are supposed to remind you of that. Um, and then things, Zachin, um, in Yiddish, I was interested in, in, again, all of the things that need to be in the book. Books are things that hold things. And here are all the objects that I had inside my book. Uh, a couple of covers of uh, a Yiddish little magazine, um, an essay by Max Weber called Things, manuscript, uh, the Yiddish manuscript of Weber's original, um, original essay, and a little, little bit of a scroll with, um, with some excerpts from, from the Bible. So um, things Zachan Dvarim. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop, I think, right now. And there's lots of stuff that I could bring. I'm happy to go back to any of these those images. And I also have, as you saw, I really also wanted to, since we're at the Center for Book Arts, I wanted you to get a glimpse of uh, your some of what goes on in Jerusalem in, in a related field um, where, again, I was really fortunate to spend some time and, um, you know, and, and, and work with some artists and the staff there. But, uh, but I think that's enough images for now. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Roni. Roni, are you there? Yes, yes I am. And um, I, I hope I'm getting this right. But in your book, I think you make mention of your feeling that, that there is um, a kind of spirituality that still is embedded in the artist book, regardless of the fact that it is no longer actually a religious book. And I wondered if Absolutely. you could talk about that a little bit. So I, I want to say, and thank you for that, um, you know, and reminding me something that I actually wanted to say um, at some point is that um, you know, there's, uh, I know that I'm sort of, I'm focused here on, on Jewish artists and Jewish writing and, you know, from in this kind of this modern period, but I think that a lot of what I have to say about, you know, what Benjamin, what Walter Benjamin called aura, right? The sort of the aura of the object or the aura of the book that is, uh, destroyed in what he called the age of mechanical reproduction, right? As soon as we started mass producing things, um, they kind of lost their, their specialness, what he calls an aura. So that aura for me is this kind of spirituality, if you will, or a kind of a, an affective, right? With an A, a kind of an emotional. Uh, Sherry Turkle, uh, who's an anthropologist at MIT, she has this, um, this idea of, of evocative objects. You know, she says that we're kind of attached to different kinds of objects in different kinds of ways. And so I think that that's what I'm sort of going for in the artist book um, as somehow, you know, I don't think artists, many artists really didn't want to dispense with that aura. Like aura was the thing that, you know, was one of the things that made their work, their work. It made it resonant or it made it special. And so I think that, you know, in the artist book, we have, again, the sort of the apex, this sort of attempt to create aura, if you will, in a secular age, or some people would say that we're now in a post-secular age. And by secular, I should say, I don't mean non-religious, right? I mean, even the secular has some relationship to religion in some way. Um, so, so that's sort of, that's kind of where I'm going with, with, um, with at least these artist books that I'm working with. Does that, does that help a little? Kind of. Um, can we ask Lynn Avidenko what she feels about that in the making of her books? I mean, how much, um, Absolutely. I don't know. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I guess I look to Jewish sources certainly for inspiration, but the idea is to, to bring them into some kind of contemporary context. So, and, and then bring something of, of me into that work. So the, the bio thread started 
I was part of a, a series um, looking at the similarities or the commonalities, I guess, in Judaism and Islam. So the yeah. fact that um, these were two women in that part of the world, but, you know, Queen Esther doing her thing and Scheherazade um, speaking up. The, the book I did before that was um, in collaboration with uh, Mohammed Zakaria, who's a very well-known, internationally known Islamic calligrapher. So we were looking for the commonalities in the beginning, the beginnings of the alphabets and how they overlap and then sort of went their separate ways. So that's a little bit of background. That's great, Lynn. I mean, I think that sort of underlines for me what you just said, the connection back to the little magazine and this idea of speaking in multiple artistic languages because the, those, the Yiddish writers, I mean, the, their, their work, they really, they were utopian. They were, you know, idealists and they really, you know, wanted their work to be a part of this kind of international modernism, you know, this kind of deterritorialized uh, internationalist kind of program. And uh, they were naive, many of them in retrospect, um, but that was at least the attempt, the attempt, uh, this sort of this, again, this very kind of utopian desire for their work to kind of circulate um, in this, in this fashion um, with different, different alphabets, different artistic languages. And just one thing about the uh, Chag Gadya, the, the format of the book is also like um, the book that El Lizitsky did with um, uh, Mayakovsky, the famous book called For the Voice that yes. has those tabbed pages. So that was an echo in that book as well. Thank you. Barbara, can I ask one more question and then let's open it up to the group. Um, uh, I'm curious in your teaching, um, how students respond to the contemporary book as opposed to the traditional book, you know, in terms of their, um, you know, their Jewish scholarship and whether it's hard for them to um, kind of make the transition to something contemporary or how do they receive it? The contempt by the contemporary book, you mean? Like artist books, because I know that you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think my, my sense is that students are, are really happy to have physical things to touch with their hands. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, in other words, I, um, I've, I've done uh, in, in classes where I teach these books directly, but also in other, you know, in other classes as well. I make zines with students. We do all kinds of exercises where they have journals and they do creative doodling and journaling. And, you know, um, I think that they, they appreciate what they perceive to be. They don't use that word aura, but um, they're, they kind of connect. It, it's not that they want to give up their phones or their iPads. None of us, uh, this is not like an anti-digital book. And, and to me, the screen is just another, it's just another iteration. It's just another form. You know, it's another uh, way that we are, we are comics, even on this page, we're each a little panel with text and image. So, you know, even Zoom is a part of this narrative. Um, but, but students, um, the undergraduates that I teach, um, I think they really, they get what's at stake. They understand that they are like, you know, I, I know that we sometimes call them digital natives, et cetera, et cetera, but they're already, you know, 20 ish. And so they, they remember books, <laughs> um, you know, and they, they're not entirely really ready to let them go. So they're always really they're pretty agile and they connect pretty immediately with um, the materiality of what I'm, what I'm trying to talk about with them. Barbara, can, oops, sorry. Can you mute? Okay. Um, can we, can we butt in a little bit here as um, two people who are probably of this younger generation? Um, I have with me Shahar Kramer, who is the curator of our current uh, exhibition in our yes. second gallery. Yes. I so want to see it. <laughs> Hi. Wow. I, 
you're, you're talking really uh i need like to sit with it for a bit but it spoke so much to directly to what we're doing like with the exhibition and some topics that we're like uh attempting to open and and work with as material for the for the exhibition i don't really know where to start to be honest like there's so much like connections to what you said and just things that i was not aware of like the mem like a memorial book like the yeah. we have like Sefer a, Sefer Zikaon. so we have a piece about gniza in our uh, exhibition like a video piece uh, yeah. which is like I don't know if it's the opposite or it's like very similar to each other I don't know exactly where to position like the tradition of Gniza with these books um, yeah. Gniza I don't know if everyone I mean, Gniza is the way you deal with uh, depository books like you can't really throw them uh you need to uh bury them because because it is like a living body in judaism um the book the holy book so and we did do the the catalog we made it like kind of thinking of the living archive so we did it uh we took a lot of inspiration from the talmud so i'd like to show a little bit you put, um, Karina, put the link for this wonderful exhibit in the chat for people who don't know about it. Yeah. And then also, I love what you showed because we have like the last pages. Like, oh, ah, that's that's the Albatross. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting also to see uh, Chagall was uh, repurposing kind of the iconography because I, I always have this like, I think it's it's always a bit scary to approach these very ancient and holy and you know magnificent traditions and and they I they weren't scared at all. I don't think that they felt the same. Um, you know, the, to, to be fair, those artists in that earlier period that I'm talking about in the interwar period, many of that many of them might have come from religious backgrounds. Tra traditional backgrounds is a better word for it, right? <laughs> traditional yeah. Jewish backgrounds, maybe in provincial settings, in rural settings. Um, but, you know, with the late 19th century, which is when Jews were first allowed to attend art schools in the Pale, you know, in, in Russia at the time. Before that, they weren't even allowed to study art in that way. And Chagall is a part of that first, gen first or second generation. So they're they get over. In other words, they're immersed in that wor world, but they're they're close to it. But they they kind of feel more familiar with it, and so it's not this like oh, don't touch that kind of thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, but also so, a lot of the stuff you showed, even the more recent, it's like I'm interested in what you or or uh, Lean or anyone that uh, approaches these. Uh, um, methods or like takes inspiration from these sources is there a sense like of oh but i can't appropriate this yeah so this is um somebody from salt lake city sent me this um i'll put the link in the um in the chat in a minute this is a friend of mine who repurposes old books into journals and he found a sidor he found a prayer book and he, he messaged me on Instagram and he said, he said, is it okay if I do what I wanna do with this book? Like, I feel like maybe not, he's not Jewish, but he's, he's Mormon actually. So he understood, you know, that maybe there wasn't like, there was something not kosher there. And I, I'm a secular person. I said, oh, make that for me, please. And he sent it to me. And he also sent me kind of the guts as well. In other words, this, the prayer book that was inside. So I personally, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, to Lynn, if you're, if you have anything to say about this, I'm curious, you know, I, as a, as a secular person, I don't have a problem with this. Andy Arnovitz comes from an Orthodox background. She's the, the Jerusalem artist that I, that I showed those examples, the Esther Rob poems and the living, the, the, the Gader Chai, the shrub, the one in Jerusalem. And, and her work is, I think, a really interesting 
and maybe less, I don't, I don't want to say unique, but it's the example of somebody who comes from the Orthodox world um, and but who's but who's kind of artistic bona fides are really profoundly contemporary. Um, and so she would be sort of, it'd be interesting to sort of see what she has to say about this idea of this repurposing, like what, how far can it go? Because the Geniza that you mentioned um, is, is, is another form of repurposing, right? I mean, you can't, you're not allowed to destroy these books because they are, as you say, connect, you know, like the, they're treat, to treat them as a body and give them a proper burial because they have God's name written in them. Um, but, but that's, you know, that's that older sensitivity with religious texts. What I'm talking about is where does that sacredness go when you have, you know, these texts which are profoundly secular. I always tell my students, the poetry is not a prayer. It's in Hebrew and it might look like a prayer, but it's not. It's a poem. It's a lyric poem. Um, so, and I think that the materiality kind of, again, in different genres kind of is present in different ways. I went on too long, but I liked your question, Shahar. Isn't a prayer a poem? Isn't a poem a prayer? Well, there's liturgy. There's a, there's a canon of liturgy. And much of the liturgy, a lot of the liturgy started out as psalms, started out as poems, and then they became part of a liturgical canon. But I'm talking about poetry by Huda Amichai, who, whose work Lynn has, you know, has, has sort of repurposed and done interesting things with. These are secular Israeli contemporary poets. They are not writing prayer. They're writing poems. It might look like a prayer, but it's not. Well, and I know that Amichai has been... David was a uh, contemporary in his time. Yeah, he wrote poems. He did, the author of, he wrote poems. He wrote poems, of course. Also Solomon has all the very beautiful songs. I wonder if you Michai, like uh, hundreds of the, like in the far, far future, if it will be like, uh, if it's just a matter of time, no, no. I have a firm answer to that. I mean, he would roll over in his grave if his poems, if his poems became treated as prayer. I know that Amichai, in particular, I mentioned him because he is probably the 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 Israeli poet whose work has sort of been most absorbed into the American Jewish canon, and he appears often in uh, liturgical settings. But I I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting. Question, right. If we are in this post secular place, maybe we're headed to another another uptick of religion. I have no idea. I can't see the future. But I don't know. I have to say that I feel that any time you, um, you know, take, let's say, a biblical story or some kind of liturgical text and do something contemporary where, with it, you're giving it a new life. So I. I can't see how that ever can be wrong. Um, and the other thing is whatever passion you have and you put into your work, I mean, I feel that it gives it a kind of resonance. You can call that aura, you can call that spirituality, you can call it whatever you want. Um, but um, I mean, I don't really care. <laughs> it's just that to me has a sacredness because of the intention that you put into it. And I, I don't feel that there is, I mean, yes, when I'm working and I'm con concerned about what I'm doing, I would ask somebody who I trusted in the field, you know, to say, this is okay what you're doing, or maybe it's not. But, you know, for the most part, I feel that if you, it depends on the intent, you know, how you are coming towards that thing you know if you feel that that thing is speaking to you then you know it's like anything else I feel like you have a right to um, work with it I'm in full agreement I also obviously agree <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I totally think it's it's also meant to be continued well, since the Babylonian exile, uh, things changed because before that, every Jew had their own prayer. And it wasn't until after that that there became a notion that 
prayers were to be defined um, across the spectrum for Jews by elders or whoever or whomever. Uh, so the notion of a poem as a prayer and the individual's uh, relationship with divinity seems to be, uh, to me, I, I relate more to the pre-Babylonian uh, uh, situation where we each have to find our own relationship with divinity. But I think also, sorry that I'm, uh, it's, um, I think also the, the relationship with the book and Judaism, which is a, it's very strongly connected, uh, like started after the Babylonian and after the, the destruction of the temples, because that's the body, like it became the, the yeah, the, that's when the book became part yes. of Judaism. There's, a, you know, I mean, the, 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 the broader narrative there is that um, all of rabbinic Judaism is a replacement for the temple, for the, for the lost sort of autonomy in Jerusalem, all of that. This is another direction. But I think that, that, that all of that body of work comes to sort of um, fill in the absence or you know, kind of the distance, um, all of the rituals, all of the books. Um, I mean, you know, I think, uh, Roni, everything that you said, 100%, um, but I, I would be, it would be remiss of me if I didn't just kind of note that for, for, for centuries, these, these books were, were not, the relationship to them was not um, like, oh, that's my book. They were books that belonged to communities of faith. And so that, I think that collective piece um, is another, you know, it's, it's another one of the ways in which modernity or these secular genres are really distinctive. Right. In other words, they're not, these Yiddish poets were not, they might have worked collaboratively and you might see them, you know, sort of moving from Lvov to Berlin, to Warsaw, to, to Tel Aviv, but, um, you know, they, and they understood themselves as speaking to a community of Yiddish speakers, but they're, but they were very individual in there. I mean, they, they would be with you like, oh, it's mine. I'm going to do what I want with it. It's my intention. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just thought it's important for, for that piece to be to be there. There were some people who had hands up. Yeah, Shani, we... Shani would like to ask a question. So please. Shani. Do... Here. Shani. Here I am. Hi. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much, uh, Barbara. I'm very uh, much looking forward to, to read your book. Um, and I was wondering about something um, that I, I can only describe as the reading experience of the, um, the artist book, because I, I, I always find this so, such a fascinating experience. You're reading the text and you're kind of reading an object which is a book, but it's also something else. And it, it's, you're also experiencing that text in a different way. And I was just thinking, you know, 50 years of, of uh, silence for me was such a really, I don't even have the words, you know, to- It's an extraordinary book to encounter. Exactly. Even, and you and, see pictures of it. This is the one with Tatiana Kellner and the father, the, her father. Right. Yeah. And for me, just, you know, even the, the physical experience was the fact that the hand was always there. Your brain, my brain never kind of got no. uh, used to really it. it. You can't really read it. And you can't ignore it. And it's always there. So for yeah. me, that, that was something that kind of spoke to me the most. Or um, experiencing uh, Drucker's uh, books where you kind of you're in control of the narrative. And, it's, you know, every time it's something else and sometimes it's terribly frustrating and, and maybe you, you don't even allow yourself to be the author and so on and so forth. So I guess what I was... Um, curious about maybe in connections to artist books that deal with Judaism um, or Jewishness. As did you see any common thread, maybe, or things that were similar in the experience of reading the book? You know, we're talking about poems and prayers and things that maybe kind of describe no, it. In no, a, I, I, I wish that I did, and maybe for my next book. Uh, like, you know, kind of come back to this question. But I think that 
you know, the artist books that are connected to, to I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think it's accurate to call them Jewish artist books, but artist books that are either created by um, an artist who identifies as Jewish and who creates a book that is sort of, has some sort of nominal connection to Jewishness. It's, in other words, it's a big category. Um, and I don't see anything that, that, I don't know, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I don't think anything distinguishes them. They're artist books. And then they, the text that they connect with is this, again, the Hebrew canon, that distinguishes them. Um, a relationship to the body, Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's kind of, I don't want to essentialize because they're, it's just such, it's such a capacious set of, of works. Um, but the experience, I can say that the experience of handling these books bears a kind of a structural resemblance to the way in which sacred books were traditionally handled in Jewish communities of faith. And if you, if you know, if any of you have been in a synagogue in person recently, there's a very elaborate dance that goes, you know, the, the choreography, the orchestration of how the Torah is removed and how it's placed and how it's opened and how it's shut. And it's, that's a really physical, and then of course, what's read is important, but the, but the physical uh, orchestration of that um, is a, was a crucial part of of Jewish communities, again, going back to the communities there, you can't really, you have to have 10, right? You can't, reading the Torah on your own just doesn't happen. Um, so, you know, that physical encounter with the text, I think is, it resembles, it has a structural resemblance to the artist book, which, which you have to open and you have to be careful and you have to, you know, it, it, go, it starts here, but maybe it starts there. Where do you start reading? Um, so that would be, I think that there's an echo for me, but that's just for me as a scholar. I don't know if there's an echo there. I see Milka is on screen. I see Lynn I'm calling out the artist that I'm on so, screen. Barbara, you know, I mean, uh, Shachar. I don't... Barbara, I, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting in this conversation Bernie, is- there you are. Hi. Um, so thinking about, you know, the translation of, you know, what was the temple and all those rituals that were very physical and very tactile and smells and everything about that and very spatial into something that could be carried. Yes. You know, into, you know, physical thing. And then, I mean, I'm going to just, these are, you know, associations, right? And then I'm thinking about the Geniza, right? The whole practice of burying books, you know, of protecting them. And that in, in the case of Cairo, right, they're protected in a way that they're found again and it's yep. almost like a, you know, it's it's like a, what I think it really like a space, you know, when you bury something for the future, right? And then those Time remnants, up. right, or finding bones, those remnants become a kind of conversation as to where the tradition has broken off and where it's changed, you know, evidence of that. And then, you know, there's something, uh, Shani, and what you were talking about, you know, I actually was saying, no, you don't just read these books. As you were using the word reading. It's, it's, they're very, it's, it's really an experiential thing. I mean, I'm in the process. I do things at the scale of installations and performances and exhibits. And I've been thinking in COVID about how you make this intimate, right? But it's still the same kind of thing. And maybe because I'm a visual artist, I think less about the words, but to me, it's, it's definitely, there's a physical thing. And, and Barb, when you were just showing those, you know, remnants in the beginning, right? Those pieces yeah. of things, right? that you want to touch, but you don't want to touch, right? And that you know someone made them and then you want to protect them. And, and that attraction and at the same time knowing their material and then knowing also that the words carry beyond that. Those are just some of the things that, you know, I've been thinking about as I've been listening to this conversation and no, no closure there, but just, you know, so opening up those you. worlds of scale That's right. and time. I love the, I mean, that idea of the... Um... Um, you know, the the sort of the vulnerability of those snippets, right? And I think that, again, that's why the the Isker books, those memorial books, that's why they're such an important, um, they're, they're the heart of the book, really, because they they represent the, the actual material destruction. Of, I loved also of, that you talked of, about of, them uh, almost as tombstones and that people tried to, in a way, make them as heavy as possible. Make, make them, that's it. Stuff as possible. Yeah. Make as possible. 
Absolutely. And there's maps and they're crazy books. Who had their hand up? Somebody did, I saw. It was me. Hi. <laughs> um, this, uh, what you're saying about um, tactility and materiality and the Torah in particularly made me think also of the times when we aren't allowed to touch scripture, like um, like with the Torah, we can't touch the the parchment itself. In fact, we've we've crafted these beautiful surrogate hands to touch and lead us along with it. Uh, we don't kiss the the cover of the Torah itself. We kiss a book or a sidor and hold it against the Torah. And that that definitely reminds me of the way that we carefully handle artist books. I think there's a definite connection there. That's great. The Yad, I love that. So if anyone else would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, please feel free to do so. I think Milka, you know, your observation there in the chat um, is um, about the way that women were excluded. I was uh, from being scribes. And I was thinking, Leah, when you were talking that when women are menstruating, they're also like limited in what they can and cannot touch in terms of that. In other words, so women's bodies, I think, are were, were problematic, were a problematic site for, for the rabbis, for rabbinic Judaism. And a lot of that anxiety, um, I think, gets, you know, gets expressed again in relation to these, these texts, which were, you know, thought to be sort of the central, one of the central kind of manifestations of God's presence in the world. Um, so that, you know, I would love to see this image. That is a so fair. Wow, Milka, Yichus did not know that. That's, that's impressive. No pressure. Subscribe. <laughs> Milka, we should have your father give a talk at Center for Book Arts. That would be so interesting. That would be awesome. Would he would would he would he agree? What do you think? Uh, yeah, we should make that happen. I I wholeheartedly agree. Can I interview him? It. Maybe I can interview him. <laughs> That's uh, you have I to get love, in line. <laughs> I would love to make this <laughs> Yeah, I kind of wish he was here. Maybe we can send him a recording of this. And uh, well, also just asking how all about the preparation before you actually write anything, right? Like of the, of body. the, yeah. of the body, of the tools. Absolutely. The, Absolutely. You know, I mean that. I'm going to put in one last um, pitch for our class. Roni and I have been talking about this workshop for a number of years and it's finally gonna happen. This is uh, an immersive week long workshop between the Center for Book Arts and YIVO to- I, I put it in the chat. Two iconic, put it, put it in, oh, there it is, Karina, thank you. It's two there. iconic downtown institutions. We're gonna spend um, mornings in the YIVO archives up close with objects and and books and graphic arts, um, very, very special, uh, spe amazing, you know, one of the most amazing collections really in the world. And then in the afternoon, Roni will lead the group at Center for Book Arts to create a collaborative print kind of inspired by the work in the archives. So a really, I think, I'm really looking forward to it. So tell your friends, come yourselves. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah, Andy. Barbara, this was fantastic. Thank you, Ronnie. So if everyone has gotten their questions answered, uh, maybe we'll let Barbara go and invite her back in the future. But it was so great to see all of you. And uh, we will resume again in the fall. I would so just like to mention one night. thing before, I, uh, before leaving, that sure. John Clyatt, the late deceased John Clyatt, who for many years was before his death was the partner of Mindy Dubansky, uh, uh, who's the preservation librarian at the Met, who was the Center for Book Arts Apprentice. John 
digitized and made into a uh, video disc, the uh, early form of digitization of uh, information, the YIVO, I spent three years uh, photographing every object in the YIVO archive and putting it on the first form of optical disc. I didn't know that. Yivo, you know, they, um, I'm going to, I'll just put in one more little plug for YIVO there. They've been um, for about two or three years, three years now, 60 Minutes has been filming them in the archives and in Vilnius and kind of tracking, um, you know, uh, different sort of all of these, the newer initiatives that YIVO is, is, is taking part in. In other words, not only as a custodian for the past, but these kind of very forward looking operas and musical events. They hosted this, this exhibition on Jews and cannabis. Uh, very interesting. Apparently people are sending them weed all over the country. Um, it's kind of crazy. They're, they're doing a lot of really forward looking things. So um, hopefully during the workshop, we'll also get a chance to, to see some of that as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate spending Monday evening with you. Be safe, everyone. Be healthy. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. So long, Richard. <laughs> Shahar, I have to come and see. How long is it up, your exhibit? 25th. Put your email. Send me your email or your phone number, something. Yeah, just yeah, write yeah, it just here. It. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I really enjoyed the 25th it. 25th of this month? What? The 25th of May? No, of June. Okay. We'll see. I got it. I'll reach out to you. Thank you. Yeah. It was really nice to meet you and hear about everything you talked about. Thank you so much. I yeah. didn't know a lot of these books. Um, and the the whole talk is going to be archived on the same page. Um, Thank you, Karina. Appreciate it. Yeah, so Karina, we'll just take off the beginning and the end. And then, Bye, guys. Yeah. Have a great night. Shabbat.